the one, one of the worst judicial decisions in recent memory came out yesterday from a district court judge in Hawaii, and he struck down Donald Trump's revised executive order. Now, we didn't really talk too much about Donald Trump's revised executive order because basically what the revised executive order on immigration and refugees did is it got rid of a lot of the things that the Ninth Circuit objected to and the federal district court in Washington objected to originally in the first executive order. So, first things first. The first executive order was fully constitutional and it was fully legal. But... The court struck it down anyway. They said that it affected green card holders, which was a problem. They said that it was religiously discriminatory, which really shouldn't have been a problem, but they said it was. So the new version got rid of all language with regard to Islam and Christianity. The new version got rid of its application to green card holders. The new version broadened the ability for the Secretary of State to grant admission to people on the basis of exceptions to the rules set up. It's a, it's a facially neutral statute, meaning it has no differentiation between Muslims and anybody else. That didn't stop the court. So this federal district judge basically decides, and this is basically what the decision comes down to. It's an amazing thing. The decision comes down to, I don't like Donald Trump, therefore the executive order is bad. And that is not much of a simplification. The entire decision rests on the idea that he's not actually going to read the verbiage and not going to read the actual wording of the executive order. Instead, they're just going to look at stuff that Donald Trump has said over the past two years and say, look, it looks like Donald Trump doesn't like Muslims. Therefore, even though this particular executive order doesn't discriminate against Muslims, even though this particular executive order only applies to people from six of the most terror-rich countries on earth, originally named by Barack Obama, we're still going to impute to Donald Trump some sort of nefarious motive to ban Muslims because he doesn't like Muslims. So, in other words, we're not going to look at the law. We're going to look at what they said about the law. And not even what they said about this law. We're going to look at what he said a year ago about different stuff. And now, if the courts had held this about Obamacare, Obamacare would have been struck down, obviously. Obamacare should have been struck down anyway because Obama was telling the truth when he said Obamacare was not a tax, it was a fee. But the courts specifically ignored Obamacare being a fee and not a tax in order to rewrite the statute and protect Obamacare. So they ignored everything Obama said in order to ensure that Barack Obama's signature law remained law. In this case, they're taking something that is obviously and perfectly legal, and they are saying that it is now illegal because they don't like what Donald Trump said. So let's go through some of the dumber things about this decision, and it is demonstrative of the fact that Congress needs to crack down on the jurisdiction of federal courts. Federal courts should not have this type of jurisdiction. The Ninth Circuit should be broken up as a, as a, as a circuit court of appeals. This is a long-standing opinion of mine. This is not something that is brought about by this particular decision. I wrote my entire third-year law paper at Harvard Law, which I've been attempting to dig up for a while now. Uh, I wrote the entire thing on why judicial review is a constitutional error uh, and why it actually has nothing to do with the Constitution of the United States. That said... This decision is perfect evidence of why you cannot have a group of judges who think they are an oligarchic super legislature. They think they're lawmakers. They're not lawmakers. So what does this actual decision say? Well, first, it says that the Constitution bars religious discrimination against foreigners. It says the Establishment Clause applies to people who don't even live in the country. Not, uh, it doesn't apply to American citizens alone. It applies to some random dude on a hilltop in Yemen. So, in other words, if you have a policy that says random dude on a hilltop in Yemen, we're not letting you in because you are a radical Muslim, they say, well, this would violate the Establishment Clause because you obviously prefer Christians to Muslims. This is asinine. First of all, the, the provisions of the Constitution do not apply to foreigners. The Constitution only applies to people who are citizens of the United States. It does not apply to people who are living any random place in the world. If the Constitution has to grant rights to people to immigrate, Regardless of religion, regardless of viewpoint, like imagine this, okay? The First Amendment of the Constitution also says you have freedom of speech, it says you have freedom of religion, and it has the Establishment Clause that government cannot establish religion. So, let's say the Constitution were to apply to people all over the world, and now it applies to everyone. Well, the First Amendment also says you have freedom of speech. So, that means that presumably that applies to anybody abroad. And those people, we can't discriminate against them based on viewpoint, right? The government is not allowed viewpoint discrimination against you or me. It can't shut me down because of what I'm saying. If we took the same logic that this court is applying to the Establishment Clause and applied it to the Free Speech Clause, what you'd end up with is anyone, anywhere on earth, has a right to enter the United States no matter what they think about things. Okay, That's how crazy this court decision is. Other things that this decision says. As I say, the court actually says that motivation matters, not text. They explicitly acknowledge, explicitly acknowledge that there is nothing in this executive order that discriminates against Muslims. They then try to make the claim that it discriminates against Muslims, even though it clearly does not discriminate against all Muslims. So the court says, the illogic of the government's contentions is palpable. The notion that one can demonstrate animus toward any group of people only by targeting all of them at once is fundamentally flawed. 
Okay, that doesn't make any sense at all. If you're demonstrating animus for a group of people, obviously you have to demonstrate animus for the entire group of people. If I have a law and it only affects a certain percentage of black people, but it doesn't affect 99% of black people, it's very difficult to say that the law is actually motivated by animus against black people. That seems relatively logical to me. And in fact, the court then goes on to make exactly the same case that they're saying is illogical. Right? They then say this is obviously a Muslim ban because it applies to countries that are largely Muslim. You can't make a statistical argument like that if you're just claiming that statistical arguments are irrelevant to the question of animus. They quote Donald Trump from March 2016 saying, I think Islam hates us. Okay, March 2016, he was still a candidate. He wasn't even president then. They quote Trump's infamous Muslim ban press release from late 2015, and they say all of this is the backdrop to this executive order, and then they say that because Donald Trump says mean things about the Muslims, that means that the executive order is illegal. And then they quote the Tenth Circuit on this issue, and here's what they say. They basically say that maybe at some future point he could pass the exact same executive order and we wouldn't strike it down, we wouldn't put a temporary restraining order on it, because we would, we would know that he actually is not a mean guy. So now they're judging Trump as a person. He's a mean guy, right? This is what they say. From the above principles, we conclude that a government cure should be one, purposeful, two, public, and three, at least as persuasive as the initial endorsement of religion. It should be purposeful enough for an objective observer to know unequivocally that the government does not endorse religion. So, in other words, if Donald Trump spends the next two years talking about how Islam is just awesome, then they might allow him to pursue this executive order. But until then, until he goes out and says publicly that Islam is the best religion that ever was, and he loves Islam like no other... That it is big league, in his own words. Until he actually does that, they are going to ban this executive order. So they're going to mind read Donald Trump, which is a challenging thing under any circumstances. It's particularly stupid when the people attempting to mind read Trump are obviously not mind reading Trump. They are mind reading themselves in their perceptions about Trump. Okay, other things that are idiotic about this decision. So they reinforce in this decision this notion pushed by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and that federal district judge in Washington that a state is able to sue and get immigration policy held up if it doesn't benefit the state to have more immigration. So the state said, one of the big issues in, in lawyering is something called standing. I can't sue the government based on some random law that doesn't affect me. I can't sue Mathis today based on the fact that I get food poisoning from a separate restaurant. I don't have standing because Mathis hasn't done me any harm, right? You have to get, standing means that the person you're suing has some connection with the harm that is, that is being inflicted upon you. So what the court does here is they broaden the issue of standing, because really, the state doesn't have any standing to sue the federal government based on immigration policy. They don't. If they could, then presumably the state of Arizona could have sued the federal government long ago for not enforcing its immigration laws affecting the state of Arizona in negative ways. They weren't able to. But now the court finds standing to open the borders. Why? Because universities in states like Hawaii won't be able to recruit that dude on the hilltop in Yemen. Seriously, this is what it says. It says, the state has preliminarily demonstrated that its universities will suffer monetary damages and intangible harms. So now we are now measuring the state standing based on intangible harms, things that can't be measured or felt. Okay, that's totally insane as well. And then finally, I think that the, the, most, insane here, the most insane thing here of all about this, uh, about this ruling, well, I should say the second stupidest thing. The stupidest thing is this whole feelings routine, this, this routine that Donald Trump's feelings about Islam shape how the court rules on an executive order. I'll tell you the reason that that's the stupidest thing. The reason that's the stupidest thing is if people can now sue the president of the United States and say that he is violating the Establishment Clause simply because he has quote-unquote animus for some group outside the United States that violates the Establishment Clause, then you could theoretically have somebody sue Trump to stop him from pursuing military action against like Al-Qaeda and ISIS because He doesn't really hate al-Qaeda and ISIS. He hates all of Islam, right? They could use exactly the same logic they're using right now on immigration. The logic they're using on immigration, Trump says, I want to stop al-Qaeda, I want to stop ISIS, I want to stop terrorists from coming into the country. And they say, no, what you really mean is you hate Muslims. Why couldn't you use that exact same logic with regard to what he's doing in war? Why couldn't you say, well, what he really means is he doesn't hate al-Qaeda or ISIS, he hates all Muslims. He wants a war with Islam. And that means I'm going to sue him because the Establishment Clause doesn't allow him to make policy that discriminates based on religion. Okay, this is crazy talk. The stupidest thing, however, is this, uh, is, is the second stupidest thing in this ruling, however, is the granting of standing to the plaintiff, a guy named Dr. Ismail El-Sheikh. Okay, Dr. El-Sheikh is an American citizen of Egyptian descent. 
There are two issues that make him not ripe for standing here, that don't grant him standing in this case. One, he's an American citizen. The executive order does not apply to American citizens. Two, he's from Egypt. It doesn't apply to Egyptians. Egypt is not one of the countries on the list. So there are two separate reasons why. E so number one, he's an American citizen. It doesn't apply to him. Two, even if it didn't apply to American citizens, it still wouldn't apply to him because he's from Egypt. So who does it apply to? He's suing because his mother-in-law is from Syria and she wants to come visit. Seriously. His mother, first of all, this alone should, should mean that he never gets standing because no one wants their mother-in-law to visit. But second of all, the idea that he's getting standing based on his mother-in-law living in Syria is insane. How does the court come up with the idea of standing? They say he has standing because this is a direct quote. He thinks that the, the executive order is devastating to me, my wife and children, since it saddened him. I am not making that up. That is in the court decision. The court decision says that this guy has standing to sue the federal government because the policy of the federal government made him sad. Okay, I am now going to sue the federal government for every law and regulation it has passed in the last 20 years because they all make me sad, because they all suck. It doesn't work that way. This is not how law works. This is a usurpatious court. This is a court that is usurping, obviously, the power of the, of the presidency. And uh, it's about time for Congress to step in and do something about it because this is fully crazy. This is fully crazy. I want to talk a little bit more about what Congress can do here. So Congress has the power under Article I of the Constitution to set up or dismantle federal district courts to limit their jurisdiction, uh, to limit their power of judicial review. They should do this. And the reason I've said this, this sort of stuff scares people. When you say the courts should not have the power of judicial review, everybody goes, ooh, that's scary because the courts protect us. No, they don't. The courts don't protect you. First of all, when the court makes a good decision, it still requires the executive to implement it. For example, in 1955, Brown versus Board of Education. Good decision, right? It says segregation is bad. Does segregation end? No, segregation doesn't even really begin to end until 1964 with the Civil Rights Act. So it took the legislature to actually do it. I'll tell you a case where the, where the court really did do some damage, cases like Dred Scott or Roe v. Wade, where they strike down properly enacted laws uh, and, uh, and then they, uh, or, or they, or they announce with their, with their insane wisdom, as in Dred Scott, that black people aren't actually people, which is crazy, right? The, the court has done enormous damage over time, but it very rarely does something that's actually good. The court rarely does something that is useful or good. It takes legislatures to actually do that. And the Constitution, if you actually read it, doesn't actually give the federal courts the power of judicial review. It doesn't even give the Supreme Court the power of judicial review. If you look at Article 3 of the Constitution, I want to find the exact section right now. It talks about the power of the, the judicial power of the United States vested in one Supreme Court. And it says the judicial power, this is the clause at issue, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority. Okay, that's the entire thing. That's the entire thing. Does it say anywhere in there that the, that the judiciary has the power to take laws of the United States, hold them up against the Constitution, and determine what the Constitution says? No, it doesn't, actually. It says what it means is that the court has the ability to look at cases that arise under the Constitution. It, exactly what it says, arise under the Constitution, the laws of the U.S., and under treaties. Okay, but it doesn't actually say that they have the power to overrule the legislature in the name of the Constitution. Nowhere does it say that. Marbury versus Madison was a judicial irrigation of power. You may like it. You may think that it was a good decision. I personally don't. A lot of legal scholars don't. Uh, Marbury versus Madison is a very controversial decision, remains so in legal circles. The reason for that is that it destroys the constitutional structure. Remember, originally it was this. The judiciary was able to interpret the Constitution how it saw fit, but it didn't have the power of enforcement, and it didn't have the power to overrule the legislature. The legislature was able to interpret the Constitution how it saw fit, but the president could always veto and stop it. The president was able to interpret the Constitution how he saw fit, but he could have his powers taken away by Congress or by the courts. Right? So the fact is that the idea that the courts were supposed to have this sort of final power to decide what was good and what was bad, that defeats the constitutional structure, because why have a president at all? Why have a legislature at all? If the courts are the wise ones who get to decide what the Constitution says, why not just make them the kings and they can determine all of our policy? And that's basically what's happening today. So it's incumbent on Congress to take back its legislative power. I'd like to see Congress do that as soon as possible, because this is uh, really uh, this is really an irrigation of power that is that it is not unprecedented, but it is close to unprecedented. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is the Ben Shapiro Show.